I'm Monica Zatarski, for those of you that don't know me. So I already heard some whisperings, that's the pharmacist's wife. <laughs> so yes, I'm married to Dan. Um, uh, some of you may know him, the redhead that's always around here. And um, we, I actually, um, my father got me into pharmacy. He opened his uh, independent pharmacy in 1977. And the joke was that I got the gene. I just always enjoyed being there. I did every job imaginable from cleaning shelves to I was the delivery driver. And he started compounding in the early 80s and I was really drawn to compounding. So the MD Custom RX, for those of you that may not know yet, is a compounding only pharmacy. So that means everything that we dispense here is made from raw ingredients. So we're in the business of customized medicine. So compounding always interests me because it's creative and scientific. And I was drawn to the science be behind hormones from the get-go. Um, I just thought uh, hormone restoration just made a lot of sense. It really illustrated the complexity of how the body works because it really is an intricate dance and balance. And um, that's what I do now. So my time I spend, I'm here in, in the pharmacy two days a week. Um, but some of you may have seen my three small children. <laughs> so the rest of the time I'm at home. And that allows me, I do a lot of consultative work with interpreting hormone test results and working with providers. And that's um, where the bulk of my contribution lies is with the hormone side of things around here. So. I'm happy to present to you tonight about hormones and how they influence the cardiovascular system, our heart health. Um, I think this is a really great topic because uh, I think what first comes to mind when we think of hormones is menopause, hot flashes, uh, th things like that. Um, and really we need hormones for so much more. It's not uncommon that someone will say to me, well, I went through menopause just fine. I don't need hormone therapy. And uh, it's a delicate walk because really, we need these hormones for so much more than just getting through the hot flashes and the night sweats and the weight gain and the low libido. We need our hormones to be in balance for brain health and heart health and bone health and actually for cancer protection. So tonight we'll focus on one of those areas and see how much these hormones do for our heart. There's like over a hundred slides here, so bear with me. <laughs> I was weeding them out this morning. So this is what I hope to all touch on today. Um, first, uh, we have a group of women here, so we'll, we'll do good diligence and really focus on um, the hormones role in, in us women with estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, DHEA, and melatonin. And then I do get into um, the guys and particularly with um, estrogen and testosterone because what estrogen and testosterone do f in us women is totally different from what it does for the guys. Um, so I do wanna differentiate those two hormones with the sexes. And then we'll also touch on thyroid a little bit on aldosterone and cortisol, just because why not throw everything in there? <laughs> I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't know it. <laughs> um, so women and women's hormones and the cardiovascular system. So what we know is that before menopause, women actually have a lower risk of heart disease than men. So if you look here, this is age 20 to 39, and then 40 to 59, you can see the women, the red bars, are lower than the blue, the men, right? So um, before menopause, women have a lower risk of heart disease than the guys. But after menopause, women start having an increased risk of heart disease, right? So this is 60 to 79. So the, the gals catch up to the guys, and then you can see 80 plus, the, the um, females surpass the guys in their risk of heart disease. And why is that? Great! That, I was just going to say, so you, you yeah. see that, that the difference, change, the change happens at menopause. 
So what happens at menopause, right? That's where we dramatically lose our hormones. Question about your chart. Um, it looks like it's age over percent of population, so 80%, 87%. Oh, I don't have, it's not my complete, it's not, yeah, it's not a, I use this as an image to depict it, but I don't have all the labels, so I can't comment on what exactly the percentage is. Yeah. So 87% yeah. chance of heart disease per Right, that's what, I, I, I don't, oh. I'm missing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I basically wanted to, I liked this image in the fact that it shows, I'm very visual, so it shows pictorially how after menopause the women catch, surpass the guys in their risk of heart disease. Yeah. So at, and then statistically the risk of women dying from heart disease is 40%. Yes, yeah, that's jaw dropping. I mean, that's more than, than cancer. Um, it, it's, that's a huge number. So, right, why is that? So, um, we dramatically lose our hormones after menopause. So let's look at what all those, um, those hormones do. So there's numerous studies. I listed, I included a lot of studies here because um, I wanted to really hit home that this is solid evidence. Um, so you'll see every slide is referenced um, and that can be helpful too in communicating um, or bringing information to your providers too if, if need be. Um, but here's four references that back up that, um, that, that, there has, that we have seen a reduction in cardiovascular mor morbidity and mortality with replacing those hormones that we lose. So let's start with estrogen and the heart. So here's a couple studies that show that estrogen has a beneficial effect on lipids. So cholesterol, um, we hear cholesterol and its effect on the cardiovascular system. So we know that menopause, whether it be a natural progression of menopause or surgical menopause, is associated with a change in our cholesterol panels for the worst. So with menopause, we see an increase in LDL, higher total cholesterol, triglycerides also increase. HDL is the good cholesterol, right? That lowers with menopause. And then the ratio of the LDL, the bad cholesterol, to HDL, good cholesterol, that moves to a non-favorable ratio or it increases um, in the direction of the bad cholesterol even if the total cholesterol doesn't even change. So your total cholesterol could remain the same, but the, you have more LDL and less HDL. So what if, it, what if a person has um, a, a low HDL, and then when they encounter menopause, so then do they have a greater risk of like heart attack or heart disease? It, or? Well, it, chances are, what we would know is it's likely but, that their HDL could increase even more. Oh, decrease even decrease, more. Right, that's what I'm saying. Yes. So if somebody has, wow. Yes, tips the scales yeah. even more, increases yeah. the risk. Yep, okay. yep. Yeah, that's interesting. So with estrogen replacement therapy, however, yeah. we see that the LDL level, um, LDL levels actually start to decrease. And this has to do with um, estrogen helps the liver to metabolize LDL and clear it better. Um, and we actually see an increase in HDL or the good cholesterol with estrogen replacement. But isn't, wasn't, didn't I hear something about estrogen, estrogen therapy? I'm sorry, should I be saving my question? <laughs> well, you might want to save that one because I'll show you why some studies have shown opposite to this, and it has to do with how the estrogen is administered. So yeah, we'll touch on that. Okay. Um, this study shows that um, triglycerides and glu uh, glucose tolerance were improved with people, and this touches on that, who use transdermal estrogen versus oral. Now transdermal means through the skin, right? Okay, so hold on to that. I'm gonna talk and touch on that a, a, a bit more. 
Animal studies have shown that estrogen replacement reduces the accumulation of lipids in the arterial wall, um, even if total cholesterol isn't reduced. Now that's important because it's not so much the amount of cholesterol that's floating around in the system. Why we care about cholesterol is that's what can, can um, uh, attach or um, uh, uh, insert itself into the artery walls and cause arthrosclerotic plaques. Um, so the fact that estrogen itself decreases that is even more important than its effects on the cholesterol itself. <clears throat> um, this this um, basically just says that <laughs> estrogen uh, can decrease cell sensitivity to hypoxia or a lack of oxygen. And that's worth considering with heart health because heart attacks are basically star starving the heart. The heart can't get oxygen. So if you have estrogen on board, your cells are less sensitive to that oxygen deprivation. <clears throat> now the mitochondria are our energy powerhouses for our cells, right? Our mitochondria make the energy within our cells. And estrogen has a lot of activity on the mitochondria, supporting the mitochondria. It increases oxidative phosphorylation. That's basically how the cells, um, it's, uh, and ends, how the enzymes get the nutrients, okay, in order to get energy. And it lowers reactive oxygen, spe um, oxidative species. So in the process of making uh, energy, our cells give off um, uh, oxidative <laughs> species. They're highly reactive and over, and that's what causes aging pretty much because these oxidative species, mute, they mutate DNA, they accumulate, and they, ca they cause us to, our cells to die, uh, just to get, get old and, and things not, don't work quite as well. So that's why we t hear of antioxidants, or you may take antioxidants, and um, the theory behind that is to help reduce reactive oxi um, oxidative species. So estrogen does that as well. <clears throat> so I bolded that last statement, which is really key. That means that estrogen protects against future mitochondrial damage, but it wouldn't reverse any damage already present. So when estrogen is started is, is an important thing to consider. The earlier, the better, right? <clears throat> um, estrogen and vasodilation. So vasodilation is, this is a dilated blood vessel. It's nice and big. The blood can fl flow freely through the vessel, where this vessel's more constricted. It's tight. You would think the pressure inside this vessel is much greater than the pressure inside this vessel. So we want our, our um, we want vasodilation. Um, so and studies have shown that estradiol increases cardiac output, so it makes the heart st stronger um, by causing vasodilation. And it does this through um, uh, a nitric oxide dependent mechanism. Um, estrogen actually stimulates uh, plasma concentrations of nitric oxide. Nitric oxide um, is, is a chemical or a substance that causes the dilation of the blood vessels and estrogen helps promote that. <clears throat> so th these, this study uh, or several studies have shown that women that get Estrogen replacement therapy have more flow-mediated vasodilation if they've received estrogen in the past or all along. So if they got it at all, um, they, they showed a benefit. Um, and estrogen increased the release of endothelium-derived relaxing factors. So again, those are things that help the blood vessels relax and dilate. <clears throat> Estrogen itself is a calcium channel blocker. We have a lot of drugs available that are calcium channel blockers. Uh, calcium uh, channel blockers, they block calcium's entry, and so 
um, the heart's contraction is not quite as, as forceful, so it helps like to re relax blood vessels, reduce the heart rate, lower blood pressure. Um, so estrogen, estrogen does all that. <clears throat> estrogen um, prevents plaque formation. So they found that women with coronary artery disease didn't have any estrogen receptors in the areas where there were atherosclerotic plaques. So this kind of shows how this is an early plaque formation. This one, of course, is more advanced. So um, you, you would be thinking that there's estrogen receptors here, 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 and then they didn't find any where the plaque was formed. Uh, some things that can make estrogen receptors decrease are not having any estrogen. The body's kind of like, well, there isn't any estrogen around. Why should I have a receptor for it? Another thing to keep in the back of your head, however, is too much estrogen decreases estrogen receptors as well. It's almost like a desensitization. If you're flooded with estrogen, the body's like, well, I don't need so many receptors because there's just so much, there's tons of estrogen around. So that's something to, to sorry, think about too. Both not enough and too much estrogen can decrease estrogen receptors. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it was also found that estrogen replacement therapy uh, limited um, uh, basically what happens is when an artery is injured or also um, transplanted, think about bypasses, okay, um, anytime um, the artery is injured that predisposes it for the potential of forming an atherosclerotic plaque. Uh, estrogen limited this. Um, so this was a study done in women that were getting angioplasty, so they insert a balloon, which you can imagine could irritate or injure the, the artery, and, um, uh, and also um, getting um, bypasses too. <clears throat> and these are just um, potential mechanisms for how estrogen may limit the formation of atherosclerotic plaques. Estrogen also helps repair vascular wounds. Um, it does so by various mechanisms. Um, and it also helps prevent coronary hyperreactivity. So it just helps um, vessels not like over constrict or, or, or spaz out, if you will. No, I'm, I'm thinking more of um, damage done by inflammation or atherosclerotic plaques, yeah. Um, so the carotid um, arteries are those two big arteries that go on the side of our neck. Um, and a lot of times they're studied um, because that's another um, highly dangerous area for plaque formation to occur. Um, and so there are studies that showed consistent reduction in um, plaques in the carotids with women, postmenopausal women using estrogen replacement compared to those that weren't on any. Uh, estrogen out also lowers blood pressure. We talked about how it's already a calcium channel blocker, um, but it also does that um, through a couple uh, other mechanisms as well. even more mechanisms of how it lowers blood pressure. <clears throat> uh, these, these are three studies that showed that women on estrogen replacement therapy had lower calcification scores than women who were not on any estrogen. Left uh, ventricular um, systolic flow measurements were increased, so it's basically, these are all um, um, measurements of how well the heart is pumping or contracting, um, and they were all improved with estrogen. All right, so I said I'd talk a little bit more about differences in how the estrogen is dosed. So this study found that oral estrogen replacement 
is considered pro-inflammatory. And this has to do with what the, because when we take something by mouth, after it goes through the gut, it goes through the liver. And so when the liver gets a hold of estrogen, it can convert it into some pro-inflammatory metabolites. However, if you put the estrogen through your skin, a patch or a cream or a gel, it doesn't go through the liver right away. And it actually has an anti-inflammatory effect. So I think that is incredibly important because we're talking about the same thing, but how it's dosed has completely opposite effects. With coagulation or the forming of, of potential blood clots that could cause um, uh, an, uh, an aneurysm or a thrombosis, um, estrogen actually HRT, hormone replacement therapy in general, lowers uh, fibrinogen levels. Um, so it decreases the ability to coagulate. Um, also, uh, there is no increase of thrombosis with transdermal estrogen, but just the opposite with oral. So another important differentiation. So just... I, that's a lot of science and heavy research, but just remember that estrogen does have a beneficial Im effect on the cardiovascular system and that the timing of estrogen is important. It, there is evidence that the earlier you um, replace the estrogen, the better. Um, and then I'd just like to hit on that there's great differences between oral and transdermal. So let's touch on progesterone. <clears throat> so there's um, progesterone and then there's progestins. So progestin is at the accurate term for a synthetic progesterone um, because those two also are apples and oranges. They could not be more different. Uh, nothing tends to irk me more than when I hear progesterone being called a progestin or vice versa because they're totally different. So huge differences um, here in terms of cardiovascular health as well. Um, a lot of times, medroxy, progesterone acetate, MPA for short, that's Provera, or the Pro in PremPro, um, is often studied in because that's a progestin that's probably prescribed the most in a postmenopausal woman. Um, so um, Provera or medroxy, progesterone acetate has actually been shown to increase the proliferation of coronary artery smooth muscle um, where progesterone inhibits it. So completely opposite in that e example. <clears throat> also, um, well, this is basically saying this, the same thing but just giving you the mechanisms and how, how that happens. Um, also, um, progesterone but not medroxy progesterone acetate improved the beneficial effect that estrogen had on exercise-induced ischemia or lack of um, blood flow um, to the heart. Yep. So lack of blood flow meaning that more prone to blood clots? No, no an angina. Angina. Yep, yep. Or, yeah, so it, uh, like people taking nitroglycerin because they, um, yeah, it, it almost feels like a mini heart attack. Mm -hmm but it's just because there's, the blood can't get to the heart ac adequately enough. So it's, it's like, a, a star, like the starving of oxygen. Oh. So yep, it, it hurts mm -hmm. um, and it can be induced by exercise as well as you can imagine because you increase your cardiac stress, mm -hmm. you're increasing the chance for that event. Progesterone too has shown to lower blood pressure. <clears throat> um, this, this too, we mentioned that estrogen helps prevent coronary hyperreactivity or like the spasming, um, progesterone does as well. <clears throat> and we are already mentioned that progesterone um, inhibits that proliferation, but again, it was not seen with the medroxy progesterone acetate. There's a um, very huge trial called the PEPI trial, 
and it actually showed that micronized progesterone yielded a more favorable elevation in HDL than any other forms of progesterone. So, that I call progesterone our Wonder Woman. Um, natural progesterone, bioidentical progesterone. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, testosterone. So testosterone replacement has been shown in women to relax coronary arteries and improve, uh, allow more blood flow to the heart. Um, and similarly, testosterone replacement has been shown to decrease the symptoms of angina, like we just talked about. <clears throat> testosterone replacement therapy was found to lower lipoprotein A levels by up to 65%. Lipoprotein A is another part of the whole cholesterol panel, and it actually is very closely linked to cardiovascular risk. <clears throat> All right. DHEA in the heart. Have people heard of DHEA before? I think it gets a little less... less talked about maybe potentially, but it too is an androgen-like hormone. Um, we Women get most of our DHEA from our adrenal glands, um, and it's also referred to as being the vitality hormone. It helps with energy and muscles and brain and all kinds of great stuff. It's one of the most prevalent circulating hormones in, in our bodies, um, very, a very important hormone. Um, so the first study there showed that it too declines with age, just like all of these hormones do. So an age-related decline of DHEA was associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease in women. DHEA has been shown to be an anti-remodeling and a vasorelaxant drug, again, allowing those blood vessels to, to dilate. There's a study of postmenopausal women with coronary risk factors un undergoing um, they, they, they were basically being evaluated for suspected um, lack, of, lack of oxygen to the heart. And they showed that those women with the lower DHEA levels had a higher mortality rate. So lower the DHEA, the higher your risk of death. This study showed that DHEA levels were inversely associated with atherosclerosis. Um, so again, lower the DHEA, higher the atherosclerosis. Um, also, we'll mention, because in men I'm gonna just really touch on estrogen and testosterone because they, they're so different. So I did throw some studies in here for the guys that low DHEA in men has also um, been shown to have an inverse relationship to heart disease, just like for the gals. <clears throat> and these, um, this too is in, in men. Um, the DHEA concentration was shown to be independently and inversely related to death from cardiovascular disease in men over 50. Um, low levels of androgens were shown to increase the risk of atherosclerosis in the men too. And um, low levels of um, DHEA were decreased, or the levels of DHEA were decreased in patients with chronic heart failure in proportion to the severity of their disease. So the lower the DHEA, the greater their, their um, disease severity. <clears throat> Um, replacing the DHEA improved arterial stiffness. Also show DHEA given orally may treat systemic um, vascular remodeling, including restenosis. A lot of times after a cardiac event, the, the, mus the tissues have to like remodel is a good word. They have to try to regain their structure. And a lot of time, all, almost all the time, the new structure is not as great as the original structure. Um, it can be hardened, it's more stiff, it doesn't contract as well as it used to. Um, so it showed that DHEA helped to um, improve the, that remodeling. Uh, also showed in guys that supplementing with DHEA, DHEA improved endothelial function. 
and DHA has been shown to inhibit inflammation. Question. A couple of slides back you said, um, I'm not going to say it exactly, I don't quite remember. <laughs> A couple of slides I can back. go back. The DHEA, it was a study with men, and you said the lower their, car, their DHEA level, um, the greater they're likely to die, or you, you mm -hmm. phrased it something like that. Now, are you implying, or are you saying that the study said that the low DHEA is causing their heart disease, or it's a correlation to their heart disease? Cor I can only say correlation. Okay. Yep, yep, mm -hmm. yep. Um, yeah, because heart disease, death, et cetera, so many factors go into play. Right. Yep, yep. So no study would ever say that. They just state that they found that correlation, that the lower the DHEA in the population, the greater their chance of dying. Okay. And that's all we know. That's right. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, this trial showed that an increased risk of developing stroke in women that had low DHEA. All right, melatonin. So um, I think uh, a lot of people know about melatonin and its effects on sleep. But melatonin is a very incredible ant antioxidant type hormone. It has a lot of disease modifying potential and it's actually um, maybe a talk for another time has been shown to do amazing things in metastatic cancer. Um, but it, but today we'll talk, we'll stick with the heart. <laughs> but melatonin does a lot more than just sleep um, and might be one of the reasons why sleep is so important, right? We need sleep to be healthy. We need sleep for disease um, prevention. Um, and some of that might just be because that's when we have melatonin too. I don't know. <clears throat> So melatonin uh, levels have been found to be lower in patients with uh, chronic heart disease versus healthy patients. One study showed that patients with chronic heart disease had a melatonin level one-fifth of that with healthy controls. Low melatonin levels cause an increase in nighttime sympathetic activity, which increases the risk of um, coronary artery disease. Melatonin is a suppressor of sympathetic activity. Low levels of melatonin could lead to elevations of epinephrine and norepinephrine. So these are our stress, our, our fight or flight hormones. Um, that's what's released when we're under stress. And they, epinephrine and norepinephrine has the potential of damaging blood vessels. Um, so melatonin, um, so um, low levels of melatonin can lead to elevated levels of those damaging neurotransmitters. <clears throat> also, when we have higher levels of epinephrine and norepinephrine, the, the arth arthrogenic uptake of LDL, so the ability of LDL to get into those blood vessel walls, <coughs> increases. So. Um, Definitely, there's benefits to having lower levels of epinephrine and norepinephrine, and melatonin might play a role in that. So, wait a minute. So, if you have lower levels of melatonin, which can cause, you said, can cause stress? It causes, it, we know there's a correlation between low, if we have low melatonin, yep. we have increased epinephrine and norepinephrine. Um, well, stress, yeah, we, well, we release epinephrine and norepinephrine in response to stress. Okay. Um, so, um, you could, you may be able to draw some conclusions like if you're stressed mm -hmm. and already have high levels of epinephrine and norepinephrine, okay. melatonin might prevent you from clearing those as quickly as somebody else that had <coughs> adequate melatonin. Okay, <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's a lot, uh, yeah. So sleep, how much you sleep affects your melatonin, your pain too? 
Well, one sign of not having adequate melatonin is, is an inability to sleep. However, just because you're sleeping doesn't necessarily mean you have adequate melatonin. Yep, you can test melatonin. Um, we actually have a, a diurnal melatonin test, so you um, collect four samples, because melatonin should be lower in the day and then increase when you sleep. And um, so that, that can be really useful to see if you... Um, saliva or dried urine. You just pee on some paper. I think the dried urine is the diurnal test. Actually, I don't think they can do that in saliva because it's actually a melatonin metabolite that they're looking for. And then um, there's also a study that found that melatonin inhibits platelet aggregation, so helps with preventing clot formation. Melatonin has been shown to reduce hypoxia, or that being starved for oxygen, and, and prevents um, reoxygenation-induced damage in patients with cardiac ischemic, ischemia and ischemic stroke. So, <clears throat> patients who develop adverse events post-MI or post-heart attack were shown to have lower nocturnal melatonin levels in patients without adverse effects. And these adverse effects were pretty bad. They included death, <laughs> uh, 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 chronic heart failure, or congestive heart failure, and having another heart attack. <laughs> so um, pretty bad adverse effects. Uh, melatonin cardioprotective functions include that it's a vasodilator again. It's a free radical scavenger, so it's, it's helping. It, like I mentioned, it's an antioxidant hormone, so it too, like we talked about estrogen decreasing those reactive oxidative species, melatonin does that as well. And it also inhibits oxidation of LDL. So it's when LDL becomes oxidized that it's more um, able to get into that arterial wall. The MARIA study was interesting. They actually um, gave IV melatonin to patients following a heart attack, um, and it was found to decrease um, um, pro-inflammatory uh, uh, mediators. It, it also lessened tissue damage, and it decreased uh, VTAC and VFib, or um, uh, 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 what's the word? That I'm looking for. Thank you. <laughs> Arrhythmias. Um, and also lessened cellular and molecular damage from ischemia. Was that in patients with low melatonin or was that, were they just administering that? I, I, I believe that it, they, it wasn't necessarily patients in low, with low melatonin. It was just anyone, yep, after following an MI. All right, so the guys, how are they different? So we talked about, um, so estrogen in males can actually increase with age, which is, we, we really don't have a hormone that increases with age. The guys uh, potentially um, can have increases in estrogen as they get older. And this is due to a variety of reasons. Um, aromatase is the enzyme that converts testosterone to estrogen and they have increased aromatase activity as they get older. They can have alterations in their liver function which contribute to that. Zinc deficiency, obesity, um, that's because um, the middle, the abdominal weight has increased aromatase activity as well. Alcohol, uh, estrogen imbalances can be drug induced. There can be drugs that increase the conversion of testosterone to estrogen or decrease testosterone itself too, which leads to this estrogen imbalance. And also um, ingestion of estrogen containing food, like all the hormones in dairy and meat and environmental estrogens. So there's a lot of xenoestrogens or, excuse me, chemicals out there that act like estrogen in the body. So, these, um, the study sh found that elevated levels of estrogen in guys was associated with an increased risk of heart disease, and as well as an increased risk of stroke. So 
So this is my guy with high estrogen, and it says high estrogen in men cause stroke, constant fatigue, increased size of breast tissue, enlarged prostate and prostate cancer, loss of muscle tone, an increased risk of erectile dysfunction and low libido, increased fat tissue, heart disease. Studies showed that elevated circulating estradiol, which is one of the, we have three estrogens in our body, estradiol, estrone, and estriol. So this study um, just looked at estradiol and showed that it's a predictor of progressing carotid artery thickness. So we talked about that big artery that goes up your neck. High estradiol levels in men were associated with acute MIs, heart attack. High estrone, that's one of the other est estrogens, and low testosterone was associated with promoting um, atherogenesis or cor coronary heart disease. Low testosterone and elevated estradiol was associated with um, lower um, extremity peripheral artery disease, so in the legs. Elevated levels of estradiol were associated with increased incidence of stroke, peripheral vascular disease, and carotid artery stenosis compared to subjects that had lower estradiol levels. Studies showed that men with heart attacks had high estradiol and low testosterone levels. Elevated levels of estrogen in men were associated with an increased risk of heart disease. See the opposite all the good heart stuff it does for us gals and when estrogen's too high. It's all about balance, right? Guys need estrogen. So it's not about taking them down to no estrogen. They need estrogen for their brains, their bones, and their sexual function. But if it gets too high, that's when the balance tips. That's when estrogen starts to increase risk for them. So it's about keeping, keeping it in balance. So same with guys, so this is, or same with testo low testosterone. So this looks exactly the same as my guy with high estrogen. This is the guy with low testosterone, same thing. Stroke, constant fatigue, increased breast tissue, enlarged prostate and prostate cancer, loss of muscle tone, increased risk of erectile dysfunction and low libido, increased fat tissue and heart disease, same thing. Um, so this study showed that men with coronary artery disease had significantly lower total testosterone um, as well as free testosterone and bioavailable testosterone. Low endogenous testosterone concentrations were related to mortality due to cardiovascular disease. So again, death due to cardiovascular disease. As a study showed that men with cardio or um, coronary artery disease under the age of 45 had total and free testosterone levels significantly lower than controls. And men with low testosterone levels under the age of 45 were found to have a 3.3 time risk of premature heart disease. There's um, a lecturer uh, um, and physician, Pamela Smith, she's in Michigan, and she does a lot of lecturing in the anti-aging circuit. And she told us that in her clinic, whenever she has a guy under 40 um, with uh, heart disease, he always has a low testosterone. She, 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 she's planning on publishing her data, um, but yeah, it's, it's very strong correlation. Studies show that free that low free testosterone predicts mortality, again, from cardiovascular disease. Low testosterone levels have been found to be associated with atherosclerosis in men. So here too, showing the, the buildup of plaque, narrowing that artery. Low testosterone is a predi prediction of hypertension, high blood pressure. In males with heart failure, low serum androgens were associated with um, adverse uh, prognosis. So the lower um, their androgen levels, the worse off their, their heart failure. <clears throat> Testosterone replacement has been shown to decrease inflammation and lower total cholesterol. 
and low dose supplementation of testosterone in men with chronic angina um, reduce their exercise induced ischemia. So, transdermal testosterone was shown to improve uh, angina by increasing uh, tolerance versus the controls that weren't getting testosterone. And testosterone replacement reduced exercise induced um, ischemia again. So um, again, I, I mentioned that after a heart attack, those tissues have to kind of reform, and they do this by forming new blood vessels called, and that process is called neoangiogenesis. And testosterone was found to inc improve that, increase that the ability to do that. <clears throat> um, the study two, we mentioned several studies that show that testosterone improves ischemia, um, and this study contributed that to a coronary relaxing effect, so dilating the blood vessels, getting more blood, getting more oxygen to those tissues. I have a question. This is about men. A man, a male who has prostate cancer, who is taking Lubron injections to block the hormone, is now going to be at a higher risk for coronary artery disease because all the hormones are being blocked. want to survive but you know yeah that's exactly right yep yeah yeah right yeah yep yeah what do you do with that right I know somebody in that situation and it's like oh my gosh no yeah there's different schools of thought out there and everybody's Prostate cancer can be different, and whether it, you know, how um, um, encapsulated it is, or what the risk of metastasizing or spreading is. Um, but there, are, there's a school of thought that um, thinking about hormone restoration rather than these hormone depleting drugs in prostate cancer, because if we think about we. There's a bit of a misnomer that testosterone is causing prostate cancer. Otherwise, all these 20-year-old men would be having prostate cancer and not, you know, 70, 80. That's right. So there's a lot of, I would advocate for the guys too. I think the girls are doing a, a much better job of testing their hormone levels early and getting, getting on the restoration um, path and the guys could 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 use a little bit of catching up <laughs> yeah because if we could stay ahead of that that scale tipping where we lose the testosterone and gain all the estrogen um, I think a lot of that could be minimized so how would you recommend if a guy did want to you know um, stay on top of that how would you recommend he goes about that is that can go into a GP and be like I'm interested in this can you blood work or what, what yeah they can um, definitely try unfortunately um, um, functional medicine or restorative medicine has is lost um, we're really good at treating diseases um, and treating sections of the body but um, we have lost the ability so there are practitioners we, we have about yeah yeah um, we do, we do. Yep, yep. So I could provide that, but or a lot. What we're I'm hearing more and more of, which is really encouraging, are people going to their GPs or their primary care physicians and having that conversation, and the provider comes back to them and goes, "I'm all for that. I just don't know how to do that." Mm -hmm. And so we're here to help. So the three of us, the the patient, the provider, and the pharmacist, could work together, mm -hmm. um, and that that's that's what I. That's what I do. I'll I'll look, I'll look at the test results and I'll tell the provider what I see, and then if we're all in agreement, yeah. we can work together too. Yeah. So more and more are very open to that. It sounds kind of like you're saying, like you said before, balance is, is kind of more key than just patching symptoms with something that could cause other. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Good discussion. All right. So uh, this study too found that. Testosterone is a coronary vasodilator. 
um, it, by acting as a calcium channel blocker in guys. So we have our estrogen, the guys have their testosterone. Um, testosterone replacement uh, moderated the metabolic components associated with the cardiovascular risk. And testosterone repl replacement decreases inflammation, and it does so by decreasing the inflammatory cytokines and increasing the anti-inflammatory cytokines. And it also lowers total cholesterol. So can I ask, if someone has already had a heart attack, are these things still vital for them to... Yeah, because so many of these studies were actually looking at testosterone replacement after an MI. Yep. Yep, I definitely think it, it could help. Mm -hmm. um, can they work with, you know, they obviously are on different medications after being, having a heart attack. Can, can these work in um, coherence with the... Yeah, there, that's the nice thing about the bioidentical hormones is there really aren't any drug interactions because these are endogenous to the body itself. Um, so yeah, this, this study too hits home. This, these were in patients with chronic uh, or congestive heart failure, so not necessarily post-MI, but um, and testosterone replacement was shown to improve exercise capacity, improve their insulin resistance, and improve muscular performance. Testosterone replacement shown to be helpful in patients with severe heart failure. And this is just worth mentioning. Mm -hmm. Testosterone can also get changed by an enzyme called 5-alpha reductase to dihydrotestosterone or DHT. And that's worth watching because DHT actually in increases atherosclerosis. So that's not a favorable hormone. So we wanna make sure when we're giving testosterone that it's at the right dose itself and that it's not getting converted to estrogen and that it's not getting converted to DHT. Thyroid. The link between thyroid and cardiovascular disease has been known for a long time, 100, 100 years. Um, studies show that hypothyroidism, or low thyroid, has been linked to MI, heart attacks, coronary atherosclerosis, and chronic heart congestive heart failure. Having thyroid hormones optimized improves lipids, improves heart failure, it's vasodilatory, um, it helps the heart work better, it improves CRP, which is a marker um, of inflammation, as well as homocysteine, it improves arterial stiffness, and it prevents abnormal um, remodeling after the MI that we talked about. Those are references for those. This um, is actually a diagram from the American Heart Association. And I, I like it because it shows this vicious pathophysiological circle between low thyroid and heart failure. So if you have low thyroid function, it affects the heart. It decreases the ability of the heart to work. It also um, decreases um, the ability or um, uh, the peripheral vasculature, so it increases like vascular resistance, and then it also has negative effects on bone, brain, kidney, muscle, and the neuroendocrine system. And so all of those things further progress heart failure, which worsens the thyroid function, which worsens the heart failure, and it's a vicious cycle. I have that problem significantly, but I also take your bioidentical hormones. So what is a thyroid hormone? Am I getting that in the bioidentical? I don't really know. So um, thyroid, so, um, so we have our sex hormones like estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, DHEA. Um, those, the body all makes from cholesterol, which um, it's also feeds into this lecture because you actually need cholesterol to make hormones. Thyroid actually um, is synthesized by your thyroid gland. I'm still confused. So if I take your bioidentical hormones, which is what I'm doing, 
What is a thyroid hormone? I take it would be called thyroid, or it might be called T4 or T3. Oh, I, I take... Um, or synthroid. synthroid. I take that. Yes, so that's, that's your thyroid hormone. Okay. So are you doing everything you can be proactively? That's really all you can do, right? Yes, and then, right, just, yeah, making, um, you always want to be followed because, right, right you want to make sure everything's yeah. in balance. Yeah, 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 okay. you got, sounds like you have your bases covered. Um, so, that, that's a good segue because I, this slide talks about T3, and so the thyroid that comes, the majority of the thyroid that comes from the thyroid gland is T4, and T4 is inactive. Uh, the body has to take off an iodine and make it T3. And then T3 is, avail is actually what goes into the cells and does, does a function, does an action. So um, the, this study showed that um, T3 increases cardiac contractility, uh, decreases systemic vascular resistance, and that cardiovascular disease may be associated with having low T3 levels. Reverse T3 is something that the body tends to do with T3 in periods of stress. So T3 is very metabolically active, and if you're stressed out, you tend not to, your body doesn't want you to be metabolically active, it wants to conserve energy. So it takes the T3 that you're making and shunts it to something called reverse T3, and reverse T3 is dead in the water, it can't do anything for you. So this study showed that having a low ratio of T3 to reverse T3, or in other words, having a lot of reverse T3, is a predictor of mortality in heart failure. Um, it also, um, there's a couple studies here that gave IV T3 in heart failure. This one found that it was well tolerated and it increased cardiac output and it decreased systemic vascular resistance. How is, how is that tested for? Is that a blood test or saliva? Or? T3? Yeah. Or, yep, yep. It's a, uh, it can be done serum, or we have test kits here that's a finger prick, so it's a blood test. For, yep, you can look at T4 and T3 levels. Reverse T3 um, is a more difficult test to do. It's expensive and it's outsourced. Um, I don't have a, a way to test for that. I know most um, uh, practitioners' offices would know how to order that test, and I know it takes it takes a while to do and can be expensive and might not be covered. Um, The study showed that thyroid hormone dysfunction played an important role in the progression to heart failure. And thyroid hormone replacement showed improvements in remodeling. Um, good stuff. Here's that other study that, that used the IVT3. Um, this, this was used in patients with heart failure and low T3 synd syndrome. <coughs> and it uh, decreased their heart rate. It improved their... Um, Natriuretic peptide, which is um, a substance that helps with controlling blood pressure, things like that. Um, and it also improved ventricular performance, so the ability of the heart to work. VTAC, an arrhythmia, is associated with low T3 or low T3 to T4 ratio. And it, again, that increased reverse T3. Low T3 is predictive of um, AFib, another arrhythmia, post-bypass. Um, and low T3 is a strong predictor of death in cardiac patients. Studies show that menopausal women with TSH levels in the upper reference range have increased arterial stiffness compared to women with, with low TSH. So TSH is thyroid stimulating hormone, and a lot of times that's the gold star for measuring your thyroid function. So um, thyroid stimulating hormone is secreted in the brain and that's what tells the thyroid to make hormone, to make T4 or secrete T4. So when your thyroid circulating thyroid levels are low, your TSH gets higher because it's telling your thyroid to make thyroid. 
So it's an inverse relationship. So um, when, if you have a higher TSH, it would be thought that you have lower circulating thyroid hormone. <clears throat> the study showed that an elevated reverse T3 was the strongest predictor of mortality in the first year after an MI. So um, that, that might be worth filing if you or a loved one or anyone you know ever has a heart attack. You may, uh, it may very well be worth asking or investing in that reverse T3 level. Thyroid replacement aids in remodeling after a heart attack. Um, and that's all the ways it does that. And then we're almost done. <laughs> Brain overload. Um, I just wanted, aldosterone is another, um, uh, it's a, it would be classified as a sex steroid hormone. Um, it is um, an intermediate um, between um, the hormone cascade, DH, cortisol. It's before testosterone from the, from the, um, adrenals. So um, it's just worth mentioning because um, this evidence exists that people with low aldosterone can have muscle weakness and cardiac arrhythmias. So don't see too much low aldosterone. Don't go running out there to have your aldosterone measured. Um, you would uh, have a lot more. You would know if you have um, hypoaldosteronism. And then um, cortisol, so we talked a little bit, uh, I know a couple, men couple of you mentioned cortisol, so um, you may have heard of cortisol, it's another stress hormone secreted by the adrenal glands. Um, and this study found that abnormal cortisol levels were associated with um, coronary artery inflammation, endothelial dysfunction, high blood pressure, insulin resistance, dyslipidemias, or that um, unhealthy cholesterol panel, obesity, and hypocoagulability, or having potential for clots. Okay, so I have a, I have a goofy question. I'll ask it anyway, but how, how would you know if you're, I mean, like, if I wanted to know what my cortisol, cortisol levels are, is there a test for that? Yes. There yep, is? yep, oh. yep. Um, we most commonly do it here with the saliva. Saliva is actually... Oh. Was de saliva testing for cortisol was was developed by um, NIH um, because what happens with first of all cortisol follows a diurnal rhythm which means it's high in the morning and should taper off and gets low at evening so it changes throughout the day mm -hmm. so testing throughout the day is favorable to see to assess adrenal output mm -hmm. also getting um, venipuncture can be a stress. And so it can influence the cortisol level. Mm -hmm. And so saliva testing is the gold star for cortisol testing. Sure. You can do it in the comfort of your home. You can very easily just drool in a tube a few times a day. <laughs> Did you have a question, Sandy? No? Okay. <clears throat> all right. So thank you for sticking with all that very that heavy science. Um, just in summary, carry, carry home with you that hormones affect cardiovascular health in many ways. Um, hormone replacement, optimization, and balance are key to helping with the prevention of heart disease and also in treating heart disease. All of the hormones in the body are designed to work together. We can't just look at estrogen or just look at progesterone. We need to look at that whole hormonal symphony. And if one, if one is altered or deficient, it does affect the actions of the others. In terms of replacement, one size does not fit all. That's why we exist here. Um, and it's important to have the ability or an option to customize replacement therapy to, to what the individual needs. Okay, Thank so you. This is really interesting, and I really, I mean, wow. Look, isn't there a concern for us women that if you're on some kind of hormone therapy that you have a greater chance of having getting breast cancer? That no, that's a really great question. So the information, the study that that came out of it was primarily the Women's Health Initiative, which is now slowly getting debunked. They're kind of like, oh, we got a little too excited. 
um, but the damage has been done and it's been done for a long time. Yeah. But what that, an, but another point is, is that that study looked at oral estrogen and medroxyprogesterone acetate. What did we learn today? Yeah. yeah. So how you're giving these, and and what's available mostly through commercial, like with, if uh, through big pharma. Oral, oral. A lot of oral. There are estrogen patches. There are some estrogen creams. Um, but also, um, the patches are, are a really good option. They really are. The, the creams and the gels that are available commercially are really high, scary doses. I have another lecture that compares what our body makes to what's available on the market, and it's like 30 to 100 times higher than what the body makes. Um, and so, um, so and I guess my take-home point is, when you hear somebody made that conclusion or you read something on the internet that makes that conclusion, dig, dig deeper and really find out what they're actually talking about. Because unfortunately, hormone replacement therapy has been lumped into just one big soup and there are many different ways to replace hormones. Um, using, you know, the risk would be different, oral versus transdermal. The risks are different if you use synthetic versus bioidentical. Right. The risks. Is it a bio? What's the better one? The bio? The yes. Bio? The synthetic is all the, the unnecessary ingredients or the ingredients that are that can cause like. Yeah, it's just different. Cancer. Yeah, your body doesn't make it. Yeah, yeah. And some though, some of the hormones are replaced through oral, right? Like DHEA. That's right. Um, DHEA, yeah, yeah. So the biggest is estrogen. How, oral versus transdermal with estrogen is a a big change in risk. Not, yeah, that that risk hasn't been identified. No, I would I would be confident in saying it's not there. If you take progesterone orally, you're not at. Or if you've gone to your doctor and they want, they say, oh, your thyroid might be okay now. on it because that's what made it okay or not know. necessarily if right. thyroid is very dependent on your adrenal function mm -hmm. so if like you were stressed and now you're not you may not need thyroid I'm oversimplifying <laughs> it's also dependent on sex steroid um, balance so for example if you were um, very estrogen and progesterone depleted and now you're not your thyroid may be able to function it's also very heavy on nutri meeting nutrient requirements. We need um, a lot of various nutrients in order to be able to make thyroid and convert T4 to T3 and for T3 to get into the cells. Um, it's also dependent on halides. So um, T4 and T3, those numbers indicate how many iodines are on the molecule. Iodine is a halide. But other halides include fluoride, chloride, bromide, and our environments are inundated with those halides. Um, and so that can, that can interfere with our thyroid function. It's in our water. Yeah. yeah. It's in our bread. Bromide is in our bread. In our wheat. They treat our wheat with that. Yeah. So yeah, so you can not always need thyroid. I'm doing everything I can, although I, I have a really terrible thyroid problem, which I have no traceable TSH, and nobody can figure it out. Nobody's been able to figure it out. Yeah. But he put me on your hormones, and I seem to be doing better. How often do you suggest, so he wants me to do that, the testing? So to keep us, I'm sure everybody here wants to know, how often should we do that test? I know it's the saliva test, the CRT, which gets, you know, shut twice a year, once a year? So um, I would say you wouldn't ever want to test any more frequent than three months because whenever a, a dose is changed, it takes two to three months to stabilize. Yes. Yes. You wouldn't want to test any less frequent than every, once a year. So oftentimes what I'll see is someone who gets started and they, they get tested a little more frequently, maybe okay. depending on the provider. Yeah. Um, 
every I think every six months is perfectly reasonable. And then when they more than every six months. Then when they find their very stable, like oh you haven't needed a dose change in a while, then just go to every year. Once a year. Yeah. With with the saliva testing. So the saliva is necessary when you're dosing the hormones through the skin. Which is what we're doing through you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And once a year. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. And does that also test? The DHEA? It can. Mm -hmm. Or do you have to ask for it in that test? Yeah, when, if... I if, picked up the, the kit from my doctor. Okay. I don't know if it tests for the DHEA. Um, oh, I bet I could circle it inside the kit, right? Yeah, chances are, like, oh, um, saliva profile one, two, or three okay. include... Include that? In, yes. Okay, okay, gotcha. Okay. Anything else we could do to keep ourselves... <laughs> I was not going to do the How much time do you have? No. He was adamant, and he really swayed me the other way. That's awesome. I, I, that makes me smile because, like I said, yeah, these hormones aren't just for the symptoms of menopause, or you know. I didn't have any symptoms. Of menopause. See, I did not have night sweats. I did not have mood swings. I did not have any of that. <laughs> and so I was for you. very, very. Why do I need the hormones? Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah. he's one of your practitioners that you would refer people to. And he was like, let me, he goes, your bone health, your brain health, your blah, blah, blah. And he goes, just trust me and start this and, mm -hmm. and test and see the difference. So I did. Yeah. That's great. You know, is this it's a regular scary. doctor, a regular I will tell doctor. you, I work in healthcare. She's 100% right. And he, mm -hmm. you can attest to the same thing. They, they don't buy into it, no, for the most part. They, they, you need a functional medicine doctor. You really do. Yeah. It's just not taught. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not thank you. Yeah, thank you. You bet. Yeah. yeah. yeah you know. Yeah. You know, I had all these heart issues. It was weird. And I've been on Zydanacol almost for 10 years. I'm going to be 62. I started around 50. I wish I had started earlier. 52. And... I, I still to the doctor, I couldn't explain. She says, you don't see anything. My heart results came back fine. No, just little things in my heart. That, you know, they said I had to go every two years for an ultrasound in the heart. So this made me interested to come here because I thought, okay, they, I've been going every two years. Now I don't have to go anymore. Ah. I don't know. I always wonder where, I used to wear glasses. I don't wear them anymore. But it's just... You know, I used to have, like, almost bifurcal, you know, in contact. I don't know if any of, you know, this is just my own observation. So no, yeah, yeah. Okay, things are going a better way That's from 52 to 62 then. That's a great so testimony. Yeah, and there are, there's receptors from your head to your toes, so there are, estrogen has a huge role in how our eyes are formed and how they're, able to keep their moisture and all of that helps with like being able to see so so that's amazing that's that's just great I do exercise a little I make sure I get more sleep now than I you see when I had children. <laughs> you know, there's that point where you don't have children that you can get more sleep, but still that's, I don't know. But anyways, it was just, just interesting with personal observations over. Yeah, years. that's great. I'm ready to ask the doctor, well, should I still come in in two years for another heart? Because I've been doing this for many years. And the, yeah, it doesn't, yeah, yeah progress no, or change. Really yeah. And I feel funny, and I like, yeah. what <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. You can start the process with testing. Um, so there's a variety of ways to get started. But yep, we have the test kits here. Um, your, you can order your own testing as a patient. Um, and then what happens when the test results come back, I look at them first and I write. The lab has like a computer generated report that you'll get too. But I, I also look at it and kind of make it a little more digestible is my goal <laughs> um, and then we if there's the opportunity to sit down one-on-one -on -one and go through it further if you'd like 
Um, but then in order to get a prescription for hormones, you do need a provider. Um, pharmacists can't prescribe. Um, so um, that could look like a variety of ways. Like I said, more and more general practitioners are open to this if someone will help them. So you could go to your doc and have that conversation and they could be like, oh, sure, her report makes sense. You know, this, this looks good and might be for it. Or they might be like, no, this is out of my comfort zone. And then we have providers that we can, we can share with you. The class, I get, you know, the class for the testing. You, you do this at home and then. Yeah. Um, if, if, I want to say that Hormone no. Profile 3, which looks at eight tests, it looks at um, estradiol, progesterone, testosterone, DHA, and then the cortisol four times. I want to say that's 270. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Some I, affirmations. It wasn't as comprehensive, and I just picked it up from Dr. Wickham, and it was like 175, but maybe the, you know, what, I, what he's, so I don't, Honestly, yeah, so of course it would vary. Of, yeah. It would vary, right? Right. Yeah. 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 And chances, of, like, chances are you could still submit. So we we suggest that you pay out of pocket, yeah. and then the lab will send you an explanation of services that you can then submit. So yeah. But when you compare, like if you've ever seen your lab expenses, like oh. if you went and got a serum estradiol, that oh just God. one would be over a hundred dollars. So, yeah. So, okay, I didn't catch your name. What's your name and what is your position here? What do you do? <laughs> I'm Monica Zatarski. Oh, okay. um, uh, I own MD Custom oh, with my okay. Dan, with my Dan, <laughs> with my husband and my father. Um, and so, and then I'm the hormone specialist, okay. if you will. I'm a pharmacist. Okay. I had a question on um, yeah. the value on your slide, like weight and gain. Um, it said the risk of women dying from heart disease is 40% post-menopause. Um, I just wanted to get some clarification on the quantifying of that. Are you talking about women post-menopause will say like 50 to 100, 40% of those die from heart disease? So you could be talking about elderly women or is this like a, a specific chunk that age group that you're looking at that has a higher risk or so I, I believe it was 40% of menopausal of menopausal women, it was a menopausal women. yes okay. so and right that just simply means anyone who's not menstruating anymore oh okay so that yeah be so it wasn't definitive by an age okay. just that they were no longer okay. menses yes okay. yes Stuff and bloating. I think that'd be really good. <laughs> <laughs> I love, no, I am all for recommendations. Yeah. Like, seriously, we'd love to hear what you guys want to hear about. So, I will definitely I put that in. Yeah. I also heard pills too. Like, my gynecologist was saying that um, the pills apple cider pills are just as effective. Sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's basically Cereals helping. Here, I, I don't have apple cider pills, but I have um, betaine hydrochloric acid, which is accomplishing the same thing just by a different name. Mm -hmm. um, basically, it helps increase the acidity of the stomach, which helps break down your food. Mm -hmm. Digest. Do you notice the bloating with eating? Yeah, and I'm trying to refrain from, like, dairy. I notice, like, with Dairy, you know, I love cheese. I love yeah. yeah. But milk, right. I can do without it. I've, I've been drinking um, almond milk. So I love it. What is that? Is it? It's like like some. We're more sensitive to it as we get older, or our digestive systems. It's something that didn't bother you. Physical. With food sensitivities, yeah, because as we age, we accumulate damage if you will oh. we <laughs> we yeah. and so in like our sign inflammation kills so the more um in, so the older you are you tend to be more inflamed the more inflamed you are the more prone your gut is to leaking if you've heard a yep. leaky gut yep. um and so then what happens is you start absorbing food that you shouldn't be and then your body starts 
eliciting a, like an attack, like a response to it. So um, that's basically the the dirt. Yeah, leaky gut, dirty, the um, of increased food sensitivities. Yep, yep. It's tied to so it's it's a, a lot. A lot of times, if you heal the gut and quell the inflammation, then you um, are no longer food sensitive. And exercising helps with that inflammation. Do you think the inflammation oh, yeah. too? Well, it helps with everything. Because yeah. I mean, I do the that I did put on the increased tea. Yeah. Can you have vitamin D here? I got, yeah. I got to adjust that, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. All right. Thank you. Thank you guys for Thank coming you. and all your great yeah. questions and Thank discussion. You.